Is algorithmic decision making really ready for prime time? I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Jeremy Howard, founding researcher at Fast.ai. Welcome, Jeremy. Hi there. So, welcome back. Thanks. Um, give us a refresh on the mission uh, that you at Fast.ai, and what prompted you to actually start the company. Sure. So, uh, Fast.ai is a self-funded lab started by Rachel Thomas and I about three years ago. Uh, Rachel's a mathematician come data scientist and I'm a coder come data scientist. And we both got, uh, we, and so we both were getting pretty deep into the artificial intelligence world and we were frustrated by the lack of diversity that we saw in that space. And we were concerned about what that meant for the kind of societal implications of this really important technology that it's all in the hands of a small elite few who all look very similar. So we thought we would try and fix that. And so we started this uh, organization called Fast.ai, which uh, does four things to try and make artificial intelligence accessible to regular folks. The four things are um, we provide uh, courses. Uh, so we have one of, if not the most popular course in the world now for teaching um, how to use AI. The second is we do academic research. So for stuff that's just too hard to teach in the course or it takes too long or it costs too much or whatever, we do research to try and find better algorithms that allow us to be faster, cheaper, easier. And the third thing we do is we write software. Now the software we write is basically taking the results of that research and packaging up so that everybody can access the kind of state of the art algorithms and then the fourth thing we do, which is I'm um, really excited about, is we have a community, an online community, where tens of thousands of people who are kind of these new now AI practitioners can talk to each other and help each other out, you know, with like everything from, hey, I've got my first job interview for an AI position tomorrow, any tips, through to I'm trying to implement this paper that was just released yesterday and I'm getting these strange results. Can anybody help me debug it? You guys do great work and Thanks. you have some really interesting blog posts and really interesting opinions on things. One of them was, was about the ethics around the confluence of big data and surveillance and a, is, and it's, I would say a big concern with everyone today. So for starters, the data sets often contain errors of a fact about specific individuals, right? So tell us about an individual's ability to correct the errors uh, when they find them in these data sets? Yeah, so um, I think the post you're talking about was actually created by my co-founder, Rachel Thomas, um, and she's written and researched extensively on the question of um, algorithmic decision-making, right? It, it, this is not some future world where Terminator appears or something, this is right now. So for example, here are some things that happen right now. Um, you're going to work, and a policeman appears out of nowhere and arrests you for no apparent reason because it turns out that a video camera spotted you and decided you look like somebody who committed a crime at some point. And then you get arrested and bail gets set. Your bail is set by an algorithm, or at least it's it's recommended that you get some particular bail, which is recommend, which is set by an algorithm. Now that algorithm is called Compass. It's used in many parts of the United States. And then the third thing then that happens is um, you then you you go to court. Um, they find you guilty, and then your sentencing gets set in theory by a judge, but in practice, an algorithm tells the judge what it recommends. And it's actually the same thing. It's again, it's Compass. Now, these are places that algorithms are being used right now today in America. And the, here's the thing, that first algorithm I mentioned, face recognition, as recently as two years ago, an MIT uh, piece of research found that the standard face recognition algorithms used by the big companies were 40 times less accurate for black women than white men, 40 times. Um, the Compass algorithm for bail and sentencing guidelines was found to be no more accurate than random, and yet was three times more likely to let off white people who would reoffend compared to black people. 
It's also found that the kinds of things that that algorithm used to make that decision was based on things like who your parents are and who your friends are and where you went to school, things that were out of your control, right? So the world is being increasingly run by algorithms. The algorithms are often flawed. Uh, they're often biased. And then to your question, what do you do about it? They don't have a human appeals process, right? Because what happens is like the judge, for instance, looks at the sentencing guideline on their computer screen. They were never taught how AI algorithms work. They just know that the, the computer says three years. So how are they going to question that? That's, they have no training or background with which to question that or even an awareness that it could, that it could be biased or it could be wrong. So in this world where algorithms are increasingly making decisions that affect people's lives in huge ways, they're being rolled out in ways that actual human beings are not in the loop able to say like, what's going on here? here. Is this really okay? So another finding, you found that surveillance changes people's behavior. So if it makes us behave in public, what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things going on here. Let me give you a few examples. Um, one which is really scary is the idea of feedback loops. And so um, let's take this predictive policing idea. So they uh, send policemen to areas where the predictive, predictive policing algorithms say there might be a crime. This is trained on data about where arrests have been in the past. And in the US at least, arrests are highly biased. For example, I think black people are six times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, even though they use marijuana an equal amount as white people. So you've got these biases that go into the algorithm. So those biases get fed back into policing behavior. So then the police go to the black neighborhoods more often because the algorithms say that's where you're going to find people to arrest. As a result of which, because they're there more often, they arrest more black people, adding more black people to the database, which the machine learning algorithm then continues to be trained on, causing more police people to be sent to the black neighborhoods again. Right? So one of the issues here is that when you have you know, biased humans, as we all are, and a biased society like we have in the US and then you feed that in to create biased algorithms, you create feedback loops that make things worse and worse and worse. And then the other thing that happens is that gets combined with human incentive structures. So policemen often are incented to make arrests. So with the example of face recognition, one of the things that a recent study showed was that um, policemen are actually taking um, uh, crime scene photos or whatever and you know with a face in them and then they're using like adobe photoshop to change them until they get a match out of the face recognition software because that's their incentive right their incentive is to arrest somebody and the reality is in america i think it's something like 99 percent of people who get arrested end up with a plea deal it doesn't go to court, right? Because it's so expensive and so awful to go to court. So if you get arrested, that's pretty much just as bad as getting found guilty. So th there's all these kinds of combinations of human behavior and society and stuff, which make the way these algorithms actually impact society to be complicated and sometimes kind of awful. There are those who say that if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. But even the Congressional Research Service can't count the current number of federal crimes on the books because of the sheer number of laws and regulations. So, Right. That, and that's what uh, uh, any lawyer will tell you is if the police ask you questions, lawyers say, I myself would keep quiet because there's so many things you can be arrested for. And the classic, I mean, the classic one in the US is resisting arrest. You know, a pretty large percentage of people who get arrested also get done for resisting arrest. But when you actually look at the video, if there is video, they're just, they're not doing anything. You know, it's just this kind of, so, so even if there isn't a rule on the book, you can find reasons to create rules in the books. And so for, for disadvantaged populations or populations who have been, you know, directly targeted, um, we, we want to try and undo 
this history and this bias, you know, and, and so using these kinds of algorithmic decision making processes have the opposite result. So, well, then how should citizens, consumers and business leaders then respond to new forms of surveillance when they encounter them? Um, well, if I could widen the question a little bit, how should we respond to, you know, algorithmic decision making more generally? Because surveillance is just one form of data that we feed to these algorithms. So I'd say like, you know, first of all, be very careful of surveillance, you know, and like in San Francisco, for example, there is now a ban in this city on um, face recognition in law enforcement, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think France has done something similar. So some people are starting to say like, okay, there are policy things we can do to try to limit the worst cases. Um, but the bigger solution or part of the solution is um, education. Um, everybody who in any way touches something which is part of an algorithmic decision making process. So if you're a judge or a policeman or a lawyer, for example, in this judicial system, you need to be trained to understand things like feedback loops and bias and data and, and, and kind of like certain technical things. Like for example, every data scientist knows that before you put a machine learning algorithm out into the world, you need to measure it on a totally different data set to what it was trained on to find out whether it's, um, to find out whether it's biased, find out whether it generalizes well. This is called using a validation set. Every single person who's involved in you know, rolling out or interacting with these algorithms should know to ask questions like, was this checked with a validation set? What was the validation set? How accurate was it? How much did that change from the training? And then we should, you know, be also asking things like, are we measuring, you know, the performance of this algorithm and comparing it by ethnicity, by gender, uh, by um, geography, by socioeconomic background? Uh, we need to be educating to people to ask the questions around what is the appeals process for people to get a human into the loop? Um, how exactly do humans interact with this? Can humans change the information that goes into the algorithm to get it to say what they want it to say? Uh, so I think this kind of, uh, not, not education on like coding and math, but education on basic data product literacy is it really important? And so that's one of the reasons that fast AI does what we do. And by the way, everything we do is free. We make everything freely available. We have no revenue at all. Like this is literally, we spend our money to create this content and put it out there because we care so much that, that this is important to the world. Jeremy Howard, hopefully you're continuing to educate our policymakers. Found founding to researcher at uh, fast.ai. Jeremy, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Um, probably Twitter. You can find me at Jeremy P. Howard. All right. Thanks again, Jeremy, for joining us again. And again, that was Jeremy Howard, founding researcher at fast.ai. Be sure to connect with him and uh, take a look at their data sets. If you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.